Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my deep appreciation uh, to the organizers for inviting uh, to this very important conference. Uh, I also sincerely uh, congratulate uh, on launching uh, Jeffrey Chia Institute. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, I am a professor of international relations, not an uh, economist or a professor of economic field. So uh, I'd like to invite you all to a little uh, less gentle and less kind world of politics, especially uh, I'd like to uh, invite you uh, to the international politics uh, uh, in the north of this region, that is Northeast Asia. And uh, this region is uh, nowadays uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in a kind of uh, uh, turbulent uh, relations uh, among each other, there are three major countries, uh, China, uh, Japan, South Korea. Also across the Pacific, there is the United States. And uh, I would focus on these uh, I mean, uh, I mean countries' uh, mutual relationship. Uh, in recent years, and uh, uh, I'd like to uh, compare the current international relations uh, in uh, East Asia to international relations about a century ago in Europe, because in my personal view, uh, the nature of current international relations in uh, East Asia is somewhat similar to international politics a century ago in Europe. Uh, we know that we are living in the world of globalization, and globalization makes, uh, makes uh, I mean, lifestyle of uh, every people converge with each other. But in the field of international relations, instead of convergence, there seems to be divergence or gap in the patterns of international relations. For example, in Western Europe, uh, the word nationalism is something like a dirty word. Uh, but Northeast Asia, I mean, uh, I mean uh, nationalism may be the main, uh, I mean, uh, mainstream idea which occupies the minds of, I mean, leaders in those countries and minds of people there too. Uh, so, I mean, the nature of international relations between uh, Northeast Asia is very different from uh, Western Europe nowadays. Actually, uh, Northeastern uh, international relations nowadays is much more similar to the power politics a century ago uh, in Europe. And uh, uh, deepening economic interdependence doesn't seem to uh, contribute much to stabilizing international relations in this region. For example, there are huge amounts of trade flows uh, among uh, China, Korea, Japan, and the United States, but that doesn't do much in stabilizing uh, international relations among those countries. Instead, there are increasing tensions between China and Japan, China and Southeast Asia. Uh, for example, China and Japan uh, are waging a tug of war uh, on Southeast, uh, I mean, uh, East China Sea, and uh, I mean, uh, between China and uh, four ASEAN countries, there are some kind of tug of war going on uh, on South China Sea. So, uh, I mean, uh, politics in this region seems to be the power politics a similar kind of uh, European uh, uh, politics a century ago. So if we observe this kind of trend in Northeast Asia, we had better uh, look carefully the past experience of humankind of power politics. In Europe, before World War I, there was power politics. And uh, uh, students of international relations uh, I mean, uh, noti noticed there has been repetition of power cycle 
uh, among major, uh, I mean, uh, states. For example, relative power of a major state tended to rise and decline. Uh, for example, about five centuries ago, the hegemonic country was not the United States. At that time, a kind of hegemonic country was Portugal or Spain. Uh, a century later, a hegemonic country was Netherlands, and then France, I mean, Great Britain in the 19th century, and the United States in the 20th century. Uh, so, I mean, there has been rise and decline of uh, relative power of major states. So, uh, my question is, what happens if a country's uh, power uh, rise uh, quickly? And, I mean, th in this time of uh, transition period, there are increasing instability in international relations. And now is, the, is that kind of transition period in my personal view. For example, the relative power of the U United States, I mean, of course, the United States is still militarily predominant power, but its economic power has been declining relatively, while Chinese economic power has been rising in the, rest, in the last uh, four decades. Uh, so, uh, I mean, one important I mean, thing we have to notice is that uh, if there is a, a country whose power is uh, rapidly increasing, that country tended to demand more important role in international relations, more important influence in international relations. So there is a gap uh, between distribution power on the one hand and uh, international role on the other. So how to narrow the gap between these two is very important issue. Uh, for example, China has been demanding, I mean, has been uh, expanding its uh, sphere of influence in my personal view in recent uh, several decades, especially and uh, how to adjust to the demand of China, I mean, as a rising power. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, that's a key question for international, uh, I mean, uh, for the policymakers of major countries like the United States. And uh, we have similar uh, experience a century ago in Europe, for example, uh, since around uh, uh, 1870s, uh, there was a shift of power, uh, for example, after German unification in 1871, uh, Germany's relative power uh, was increasing rapidly. And uh, Otto von Bismarck, famous diplomat in Germany, recognized the danger of making Germany's neighbors uh, fearful of rising German power. So he tried very hard to soothe uh, the concerns or anxieties of Germany's neighboring powers. But I mean, the Kaiser, William II, uh, William II, uh, I mean, uh, sacked uh, Bismarck, and uh, he pursued his own diplomacy, which was much uh, more, uh, much imprudent and uh, rough. He wanted, I uh, mean, Germany's neighboring countries recognize, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, a strong German uh, power, and uh, his diplomacy disregarded, uh, I mean, the, uh, Bismarck's strategy, which uh, contributed very much to stabilizing international relations in that time, in, in, in that period, or Germany's relationship with neighboring countries. Uh, so uh, we are concerned uh, nowadays uh, about what kind of policy China has been pursuing as a rising power, and uh, what kind of policy it will pursue in near future, because that is the key question in international relations, which will decide the future uh, stability or peace in international relations. In my personal view, Chinese diplomacy has become uh, more assertive than before, especially after 2008 uh, financial crisis. Probably, 
key Chinese decision makers might have thought that uh, 2008 financial crisis was uh, the sign that U.S. leadership has irre ir uh, ir uh, irrecoverably, I mean, uh, irrevocably, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, weakened. So uh, probably because of that reason, Chinese leaders might have become, uh, I mean, uh, assertive. For example, in 2010. Uh, there were, I mean, uh, I mean uh, uh, tensions between the United States and China on the issue of Dalai Lama's visit uh, to Washington, D.C. And, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the U.S. arms sales to Taiwan, also on the issue of climate change negotiation in the late 2009. And uh, uh, Chinese leaders raised their voice uh, much compared to the past uh, 10 or 20 years. It was a kind of sudden change in the attitude of Chinese uh, leaders and Chinese foreign policies. Of course, uh, in the late 2010, uh, state councilor diving were uh, mentioned that China would continue to uh, pursue uh, the strategy of peaceful development. But uh, 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 just a few uh, months later or years later, there was, uh, I mean, declaration like. Uh, uh, air, uh, I mean, defense identification zones unilaterally by uh, China uh, last year, and continuous uh, Chinese government's claim of, uh, uh, of South China Sea. All these things are going on. Uh, so, uh, how to, I mean, respond to this kind of, uh, I mean, uh, Chinese uh, policy? Uh, I mean, as a rising, uh, rising uh, 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 major state, that's, uh, that's an important issue. In my personal view, uh, there are uh, a few similarities between the 19th century Europe and 21st century Asia. For example, both rising powers, Germany after uh, the 1890s and China after around 2010, uh, both countries were demanding more important role. And uh, the problem uh, at that time and the current uh, period is that uh, the established power, Great Britain in the uh, 19th century and uh, the United States uh, at present don't seem to have any clear strategy uh, about how to respond to uh, those rising powers demand. I mean, there is no clear strategy or no vision about how to deal with uh, that kind of uh, demands and how to manage international relations peacefully with those uh, rising powers. The second similarity is uh, that uh, these rising powers uh, don't seem to care much about how much their neighboring countries fear of the I mean, uh, rise of I mean, their own powers. Uh, for example, Germany uh, around after 1890s and uh, Nowadays, China, I mean, uh, uh, they don't seem to be much concerned about uh, concerns or anxieties of their neighboring countries. Uh, also, uh, uh, another similarity is that probably, I mean, uh, uh, leaders in this kind of transition period uh, tended to be uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, are subject to misjudgment in policy making uh, process uh, because uh, because of their anxiety or their concerns uh, about uh, the relative uh, decline of their uh, countries or the relative rise of their uh, their powers. So they are subject to, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, misjudgment more frequently than the uh, usual ordinary time. And uh, uh, I'm afraid that uh, uh, 
I mean, we still do not know uh, what happened, what will happen in the future, but we had better uh, watch uh, what kind of policy President Xi Jinping will pursue in coming, uh, coming uh, years. I think it is very uh, important for him not to make uh, China's neighbors uh, 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 concerned or fear, fearful of rising uh, China's uh, power or uh, its uh, I mean, assertive uh, policy. For example, in the uh, late 19th century, because of rough, uh, imprudent uh, uh, diplomacy, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, actually uh, countries uh, I mean, uh, like uh, France and uh, Britain, those two countries were uh, I mean, uh, I mean strategic rivals uh, in, 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 in colonizing African countries. Uh, and Britain and Russia has been centuries old rivalry, I mean uh, rival countries. But because of fear uh, about, I mean, Kaiser's diplomacy and Germany's power, all those three countries, uh, I mean, united with e each other and encircled uh, Germany. And that caused, that led to World War I in 1914. 14. So if uh, Chinese leaders become too much uh, assertive that will frighten China's neighboring countries and make those countries unite with each other, and this will be against China's own national interest. So I hope, uh, uh, I mean, Chinese leaders would concern much about uh, that aspect of the foreign policy. Then, uh, uh, in conclusion, what kind of solution there would be? I mean, this is, of course, my personal recommendation. I think uh, it is better for the leaders of those two big countries, I mean, rising power, uh, China, and the established power, the United States, to try hard to strike a grand compromise. Uh, for example, the US, uh, the United States had better uh, I mean, uh, recognize China as a major economic power and help China uh, to represent uh, its voice in international economic sphere. Uh, in return, China had better, I mean, respect the existing international institutions and norms. And in the field of security area, in the, in, in the security field, it is better uh, uh, I mean, uh, better uh, uh, for Chinese leaders not to uh, challenge the status quo. Instead, it may be better uh, for Chinese leaders to try to respect the status quo in the security field, uh, considering the huge gap in military powers between the United States and China. In return, I, I, I hope that uh, China would be able to, I mean, I mean the, the United States may uh, reduce the amount of arms sales to China, considering the currently very good stable relations between uh, Taiwan and uh, China. It may send a very a positive signal to China uh, for cooperation. I really don't know whether uh, both leaders will, will listen to my I mean, recommendation or not, but uh, that may be one way of stabilizing major power international relations in, 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 at, at present. Thank you very much for listening.